Hey everyone. Um, this is the session sharing initial steps on a digital preservation policy. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes, but I want to go over a few uh, meeting logistics first. Um, all attendees are muted and the video is turned off for this session in order to prevent background noise and save bandwidth. Um, the chat box is also turned off for this webinar, so if you have questions, you can please put them in the Q&A box to submit them, um, and I will pass them along to the presenters. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties during this webinar, please reach out to Stephanie Bricking or Betsy Hedler for assistance. I'm going to go ahead and add their information to the chat box. If you need to get in touch with them for anything tech related, um, we will also um, be using this hashtag SOAAM20 and you can follow the meeting on Twitter and tweet about your, um, what you've been listening to. Um, this session is also being recorded and you'll receive a link afterwards. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers for this session now. First we have Brittany Hayes. She is a library cataloging specialist in electronic resources at the University of Akron. She wears many hats at the university where she catalogs electronic resources for Beers Library, digitizes audiovisual materials for preservation, and answers reference questions for the university archives. She earned her BA in religion from Baldwin Wallace College and her MLIS from Kent State University. Also joining us is Zoe Orcourt. Orcutt, sorry. She's also from the University of Akron. She's the library research assistant for the University Library's Archival Services, where she oversees projects specifically related to university history. She received her BA at the University of Akron and is currently completing her MLIS at Syracuse University's iSchool. From the University of Cincinnati, we have Sydney Gao. She is the digital imaging coordinator where she oversees digitization of special collections material in the preservation lab. Previously, she worked as the interim audiovisual reformatting specialist at the University of California, San Diego's Gazelle Library. She earned her BA at the University of California, San Diego as well. And last, we have James Van Mill, who's also joining us from the University of Cincinnati. He's a digital projects and preservation librarian, and he oversees the in ingest and preservation of digital content. James has worked in the University of, library, University of Cincinnati Library for over 10 years in a variety of positions, including developer librarian, e-resources librarian, and many others. He earned his BS in anthropology from the University of Cincinnati and his MLIS from Kent State University. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenters now. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to try to share our presentation here. Um, let's see. Is everything good to go? Can you guys see the slides? All right. So welcome to our sharing initial steps on a digital preservation policy. Um, this is presented between the University of Akron Archives and the University of Cincinnati Libraries. Um, we do have a slide here that is just intros but you just got intros from uh soa so just really short that my background is in management and workflows for digitization which is to say that um, i've never been professionally um, trained for digital preservation and this is just something that i've picked up as i've worked at ucl Likewise, uh, my background does not include any training in digital preservation. I, we, before joining the team I'm on now, I was a full stack developer for our repository and from my previous time in our content services, technical services team, I got really good with metadata and content management for serials and databases. And that kind of left me as the, the default person to work in this area in, in light of some retirements and resignations of, of the team we had in place previously. Hi everyone, I'm Brittany. And as far as my background in digital preservation goes, I did take a postgraduate course at Kent State and I have viewed uh, webinars on the subject, but as far as putting it into practice, I have very little experience on it. Hi everyone, I'm Zoe and piggybacking off of Brittany, I really don't have any formal training in digital preservation. Most of my job responsibilities lie in overseeing student projects, um, doing research, processing collections. So digital preservation is just something that I'm doing self-education for at this moment. 
Um, we just wanted to have this slide here to let everyone in the audience know that um, digital preservation is something that you can pick up and implement for your institution, whether or not you have the professional training for it. And um, you don't need to feel intimidated if you don't have the professional training, because as you can see, most of us don't, and we're just figuring it out as we go. Um, so a quick overview of our repository. So what exactly is it at our institutions that we're preserving? And I'm going to hand this section over right now to James because he knows the most about the content in our repositories. Great. Thank you, Sydney. At the, so at UC, we have several different repositories, uh, a few of which I think more closely relate to the work that Sydney and I do as part of our digital content team. The first is the DRC. Um, this acronym might be familiar to many of you who recall the OhioLink DRC. Um, this is the very same DRC that we copied from OhioLink when they stopped offering this service, I think, six years ago. And we are still running this antique DSpace installation locally. It has a lot of content, but it's dominated by digitized historical records and archives. We are also a, a Samvera partner, which means that we engage with the Samvera community doing open source development on top of Fedora as a storage layer. Uh, our Samvera application is called Scholar EC, and it focuses on uh, faculty owned content, though it also does have a few collections which are probably more suitable for uh, our general uh, cultural heritage repository, the DRC. We, also have a Luna image repository It is focused on art and it collects materials mostly from our uh, visual resources librarian who is now the head of our art library. And there's also some other cultural heritage material in there. And then we have just additional storage. We have just online drives that have collected project files from over the years. Uh, we have uh, storage associated with our art college from a, a homegrown system there. And a lot of stuff that hasn't that we don't really understand and we're, we're working to grapple with right now. Uh, Sydney and I are most deeply engaged right now with our, our current digitization workflow, which focuses on what we call slow digitization, high quality images of document materials with an emphasis on special collections and archival collections. And it's kind of our, our starting point as we think about our responsibilities as they relate to digital preservation. So over on University of Akron's side, um, for archival services, um, because we are the archives for the University of Akron, first and foremost, our collections related to the University of Akron, um, you know, kind of our priority. We also have um, materials related to Akron and Summit County, um, the rubber industry, including the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company collection. Um, we have lighter than air flight materials, um, anything relating to Ohio canals, uh, book and print culture, um, and the B-26 Marauder and the 9th Air Force materials. Um, and so a lot of these collections, we are actually trying to do conservation and preservation for them So um, and processing. So um, there's a lot of work that we're doing actually trying to organize the physical collections. Um, so keep that in mind when we talk about our uh, digital preservation initiatives. So one of the first things we'd want to discuss here is what is digital preservation? And um, this question gets asked a lot, and we just want to emphasize here that digital preservation is the maintenance of digital objects to ensure future accessibility and use. And make the distinction here really that digital preservation is not digitization and it's not digitization for preservation. Um, an analogy I like to use is that we have preservation for books in our libraries where conservators will fix um, split spines and tears on the pages. And so digital preservation is kind of the digital version of that, where instead of fixing a tear on a book page, we will check for bit rot and make sure that our files are accessible and so that people can still use these files um, 10 years into the future. Um, something we really like to focus on when we talk about digital preservation is the three-legged stool model in which digital preservation kind of rests on the three legs of technology, organization, and uh, resources. Um, all of these things are very crucial to foster a really good digital pre preservation program. And I'd just like to emphasize here, um, 
the organization pillar is often the least focused on when we talk about digital preservation, but it's really, really important to get administrative support and buy-in when you're building your digital preservation program because they are the ones who can offer you the resources and the collaboration with stakeholders that's necessary for digital preservation policies to really work. Um, something that Akron and UC have discovered is that in order to mold your digital preservation policy, you first have to really understand your challenges. Um, you can't take an off the shelf solution and say, I want my repository to follow OAIS standards and we're going to start that right away. Um, it's really important to know your challenges and then mold your policy. And so here are a few assessment tools that we really like and have used in molding our digital preservation policies. The first is a really, really popular one. It's the NDSA levels of digital preservation. And we really love these levels because you can go in and assess your institution on different um, technology focused digital preservation activities such as storage, integrity, um, metadata, and you can come out with a really good sense of what is going on at your institution when it comes to um, the techno technology side of digital preservation. Um, one thing that is really important to note about the levels of digital preservation in any assessment tool really is that the assessment tools will tell you what you need to improve. So say you scored a one on integrity, but you really want your institution to be at level three. Well, the problem maybe isn't that you, the problem maybe isn't that you don't know what you're doing when it comes to, um, verifying the integrity of your files maybe is that you don't have the staffing resources to actually dedicate manpower to assessment of your collections and so these tools are really wonderful for telling you where you're at and how you can improve but you really have to think critically about what challenges your institutions might be facing um, the downside to the ndsa levels of digital preservation that we found is that it focuses only on technology and it ignores the other three legs of the digital preservation stool. And so this is a really great tool to use, but we find that using only this tool will create some problems when it comes to um, trying to mold a well-rounded and holistic um, policy. And so in addition to this tool, something really good you can use together is the Digital Preservation Capability Maturity Model, or um, for short, DOLLAR. Um, we really, really like this tool because it has not five points of assessment as the levels of digital preservation have, but it has 15 points of assessment that goes from technology to resources to collaboration. So it hits all three legs of the digital preservation stool, um, and it really allows you to get this wide look at how digital preservation is being stewarded at your institution. Um, the drawback of this, uh, of this assessment model is that it does have 15 points and so it takes a lot of time and resources to dedicate your energy to try to improve all 15 points and that can be really difficult. Um, but Getting just a general understanding of how you're doing in those 50 points is really wonderful and it doesn't mean you have to absolutely be improving on all 15 all at once and every single day. Um, and so we really like to say that both of these standards of assessment follow the OAIS, um, the Open Archival Information Systems standards for having a trusted repository and so we like to use these two tools and then following these two tools we know that we're following oais standards as well um, so in creating our digital preservation policies uh, we have discovered that there are some common challenges we both of our institutions have faced in our assessment and policy building um, steps um, and we hope that these are maybe challenges you guys have experienced as well and can learn a little bit from what we've experienced. So those three common challenges are limited resource and staffing, legacy content, and deferring the work um, or 
less formally procrastination. Um, the first challenge we'll be discussing is limited resources and staffing, and I'm going to hand that over to James. Thank you. Um, so University of Cincinnati Libraries, like everyone else, is understaffed. Uh, it's important for us to acknowledge that we have some support from the legacy of uh, previous phases of work to do digital collection building. Um, yeah. When our, our dean arrived in 2012 or 2013, we started investing deeply in this. Uh, we have our IT infrastructure uh, that we built to support our Sam Ferrer application. We have a membership in Academic Preservation Trust, or AP Trust, which is a, a consortium that uses cloud technologies to do a file integrity monitoring. Um, but beyond that, we ended up, Sydney and I, starting about two years ago, ended up starting from scratch looking at these areas. Our previous investments in digital collections projects and digital preservation expertise were lost due to resignations and retirements uh, uh, that happened before the, that work could really operationalize and take root in our culture at UC Libraries. And due to some issues with succession planning that I alluded to earlier, uh, the handoff of those responsibilities um, led to a lot of institutional knowledge being lost. Additionally, we recently uh, lost our metadata librarian who resigned in April, and so now our core digital content team is just two people, and we have very large leadership gaps in our organization. Um, we were somewhat ironically fortunate a few years ago as uh, Sydney, our metadata librarian, and I were starting to look at this work and to look at our digital content strategy uh, that we identified such strong needs that we were able to pull Sydney into this work, even though it wasn't really part of her job description beyond the work that she does to put together our, our submission packages for our repository. Um, my own job description, I would say maybe 10% of my work is for digital preservation. So we were fortunate to, to have a lot of support from our collections stakeholders, uh, but our progress is, is slow. And I would say that we're learning a lot more from the mistakes and missteps that we make than from anything else that we're doing from any training or webinars or reading that we're able to do. So I think our main strategy for dealing with this is to control the pace of our work. Uh, we do this through advocacy, largely identifying constantly identifying the challenges that we're dealing with to our administrators and our supervisors to emphasize what's realistic in the, the context of the institutional support that we're getting. And we also cope with this by adopting a progressive approach to our work. So as I mentioned before, we were close to digitization workflow, and that is really where our analysis and understanding of our digital preservation needs starts. And we're planning to slowly increase our expectations and our goals as we develop the proficiency in, in this, this kind of work. Um, and, and finally, we're all really passionate about documentation. And so when we're unable to, to solve a problem, we're, we're working to, to document it. For example, we discovered an archival or a store that I mentioned earlier that has a lot of project files, many of which are archival masters that uh, if we had been working with them today would have gone into the repository and many of them from very, very large projects. And we're, we're gonna try to tackle those as we move forward. But if we can't, we're gonna make sure that everything is very well documented uh, so that if we have any more staff turnover that we don't have people discovering this stuff after they've been working at it for a year or so. I'd like to just add here that our progressive approach only works because we're meticulous about documentation. Um, I like to think of our documentation as um, building blocks. And if we don't put down the ones that, um, we, if we don't put down the building blocks right now, that is create our documentation, we can't keep building and we can't progress with our progressive approach. So everything we do relies on our documentation. Okay, so discussing limited resources and staffing for archival services, kind of as James had said, like there are a ton of libraries right now that are understaffed and archival services, like that's also a problem that we have too. Um, we have had, you know, different people that have left positions that haven't been filled. So, you know, there are a few um, kind of gaps, um, even just in our own department um, and in the, the, the rest of the library. Um, so for people, 
So for digital preservation at archival services, it's kind of an informal thing that we're doing right now. Um, we actually don't have a formal person dedicated to this. Um, so we have created a team, it's Brittany and I, and then our archivist um, at archival services, Mark Bloom is also involved. Um, so we're kind of just trying to do this on the side, um, you know, as in addition to the rest of our like, formal job responsibilities. Um, so one of the strategies that we've had for this um, is to continue our self-education in digital preservation. Um, all three of us involved uh, don't really have any formal education in this. Um, so right now we're trying to research, um, attend webinars, um, workshops, um, just try to uh, educate ourselves, um, you know, because we don't have any formal training. Since we have a finite amount of resources to work with, we are trying to strategically work around budget restrictions. What that means is doing things we can institute at low or no cost so that we don't have to apply for a grant or hire a consultant expert. Examples of that would be updating workflows, updating best practices, um, coming up with file name conventions, doing inventories, and coming up with digitization standards. There is more to list, but for the sake of time, I won't name them all. Um, one way I like to think of this is we're doing digital preservation from the grassroots up. Yeah, and so lastly, um, you know, our last strategy is to cr creating a team of staff willing or able to assist. And this is very important because, um, you know, as I had said before, um, all three of us, we have other formal job responsibilities. So I'm sure everybody can empathize with having too much to do or too much stuff on your plate. Um, so it can be difficult sometimes to, um, to you know, find the time um, outside of other formal job responsibilities. But yeah, we've, we've found that it's important to um, identify who can work on it and, and if they have time. So our next um, shared challenge is deferring the work, or as we like to put, procrastinating. Did we skip legacy collections? Oh, did we? we oh, go. yeah. Legacy content. I'm there sorry. Um, <laughs> the next challenge is legacy content. Okay. Um, so as I alluded to earlier, we have a lot of repositories with a lot of a lot of content that all together, I think, probably represent a good a decade of sustained digital project activity, plus an earlier phase of work for libraries around the a digital press that was active in the mid to late 90s, uh, putting resources on CD-ROM, many of which have now ended up in our online infrastructure. Um, so we have workflows to populate a lot of these other systems. Luna, we're actually, we have a, one of our colleagues is using JSTOR Forum to publish art collections online in another silo. Uh, this is just so much more than we can deal with. We have born digital records that are really at this point just going into storage. Our digital archivist uh, is handling the processing of those. And right now they just sit on an online drive without any system to support them. Um, so the, the overall, the work is honestly too much to deal with. So we have this insurmountable amount of content seemingly. Um, we're ironically fortunate right now to be going through a migration. Um, and this we're doing, we're retiring our DSpace repository, the DRC, and migrating our cultural heritage materials, all those contents, into a new repository. And what we did was uh, made a plan with our administrators, with our application development team, to use this as an opportunity. We're going to do the migration gradually. We did this for several reasons, including staffing uncertainty around the global pandemic um, and the financial exigencies that are arising from that. But we're using this to establish a strategy to develop collection assessment. This, this is very important because before you can invest in digital preservation, you need to understand your collections. You need to understand what is worth investing in because digital preservation is not something that you just do once and then you're done with. Digital preservation is an ongoing activity and it, it's going to require sustained investments that eventually may re require making difficult decisions about collections that aren't worth continuing to invest in and to sustain. So to that end, we are using this opportunity to develop relationships with all of our stakeholders. Um, we, as these collections are going through the migration, we're going to 
start conversations around each to identify their needs, uh, to identify goals um, and technical debt associated with all of the collections. And we're also gonna take the time to analyze our collection files to make sure our archival information packages are contained and together and all in one repository. Uh, there will be a link to this later on, but we have adapted a tool called Sustainability Health Check Tool for Digital Content Projects. It's a seven or eight page document that was formulated by uh, Ithaca SNR group that looks at all the different assessment checkpoints that are necessary to understand the strengths, goals, and risks of the collection. We found that the document overall was maybe a little too broad for our own digital content workflows. So we've distilled it down to something that is, I think, sustainable and focused for what we are trying to do. And overall, we're trying to balance our investment in maintenance versus investment in new collections. In older phases, I feel like our libraries invested a lot more in collection production and deferred a lot of questions of maintenance and digital preservation. And Sydney and I are working to instill a culture of maintenance into our digital project workflows. Maintenance is emerging as a academic area of study in the recent years. It is coming to be a countervailing value in opposition to the innovation culture that continues to increasingly permeate academic institutions. If you're interested more in this idea, there is an, uh, an informal group called the Maintainers that pulls together uh, interdisciplinary uh, stakeholders in these discussions. One of their co-directors is a digital preservation professional and many archivists and librarians are among their members. There'll be a link to that on our resources slide uh, later in the presentation. For us at Akron, we are at the beginning stages of identifying legacy content. This also doubles as creating an inventory on what we have in our digital collections. What we are doing is going through our server space as well as external drives and keeping track of all of our digital content in a spreadsheet or some people call it a tracking sheet. In the tracking sheet, we list the file name, the location of the file, and the file format. After that is done, we will make a count of files that are near preservation ready, which are files and formats that are soon to be unsustainable and files that are in obsolete formats or legacy records. Um, additionally, um, as I had uh, mentioned before, because we don't have a specific person dedicated to this, we wanna try to incorporate um, a lot of these things into our workflows as much as we can. Um, so this is just creating a plan of action for incoming obsolete materials and maybe um, even possibly using students to uh, complete some of those workflows um, and utilize their work instead of using staff time. Um, additionally, um, we hopefully will be able to request um, that all of our incoming materials, or at least most of it, would be in a standardized file format outlined by um, the dollar model or the digital preservation capability maturity model um, that Sydney went over. Um, it has a list of file formats that are, you know, accepted. And so, uh, you know, that would be kind of like a, a wish on our wish list um, to request that all of those incoming materials be standardized. And our final common challenge here is deferring the work, finally, and procrastination. Um, at UC Libraries, um, the limited resourcing, resources and staffing does mean that, you know, as everyone has talked about in this presentation, we don't always have the time to do what we want, and things often get lost in the shuffle. And we often find other things that come up that need to take our time right now. And so, what we found in order to combat this is that we set small achievable goals for your level of staffing and resources at your institution. And so that you can always achieve these tiny, tiny steps and um, build on your accomplishments. And this fits into our progressive approach for building our digital preservation policies. Um, we also have standing meetings between um, core collaborators and for our institution, that's just me and James, and it relieves the emotional labor of planning for digital preservation. Having set time to discuss these issues means you don't have to think about it when it's not time to discuss the issues. And um, 
these standing meetings have been very productive for us and they help us reach those small goals that we have set for ourselves. Um, something that we think is often forgotten is that digital preservation work is often front loaded. Um, James mentioned that digital preservation work is ongoing, so it doesn't stop. However, all this policy creating and what um, Zoe and Brittany are doing with identifying legacy content and making tracking sheets is, is often front-loaded work. So you do that work and then you just maintain your collections. Um, and it's really intimidating to get started on all the front-loaded work, but reminding yourself that it's not always going to be this hectic and this much work is, is really good. And James and I often step back and um, think about maintaining our collections um, and how nice that will be when we have finished the front-loaded work. Um, probably the most important thing we've learned about deferring the work is to avoid deferring responsibility for decision making to a committee. Um, we have tried to run digital content and digital preservation by committee. It was a rather large committee, I think, with around eight to ten members, maybe, and no decisions were ever made and no work ever got done. And so when you avoid deferring responsibility to that group mentality, I think it's so much easier to move forward and make positive decisions. Thanks. We at the University of Akron don't have a designated position in charge of digital preservation. We instead have meetings every other week, usually on Fridays. The reason we have bi-weekly meetings is because we have busy schedules and it's more convenient for us since it allows more research time. Right now, it is slow paced because we are still in the assessment stage, but eventually we will get out of the assessment stage and move on to other parts of our program. And then, um, you know, the second bullet point, I know everybody's probably tired of hearing about the pandemic, um, but we have found it helpful um, in giving us additional time to complete research, um, time that we might not otherwise have, um, time that we might be spending processing collections, actually conducting research with our physical collections, like time that we would be spending um, in the facility now that we're working remotely, um, we're able to do a lot of that. Um, hardcore research that we've we've been wanting to do. So those are kind of the challenges that both of our institutions have faced and now we also have some unique challenges um, that each of us have faced that we want to talk about a little bit in case anyone out there has also experienced these challenges. And so for UCL our challenge is um, the idea that accessibility is digital preservation. So accessibility is a huge topic at the University of Cincinnati. I know it's very large everywhere, especially for public institutions. Uh, UC has a culture of accessibility compliance going back to at least 2014. Um, the university was sued by the Department of Education because of shortcomings on our website with respect to providing access to students and prospective students with disabilities. Um, we settled in 2014 and created a plan to address these problems uh, and that included a mandate with very limited support to make all of our web facing content accessible. Uh, we do have a professional network, uh, the, I think it's called the Accessibility Network, that provides community about beyond the resources in place to provide student accommodations. There isn't really any direct help to do this work. In 2019, um, I think we all collectively doubled down on that attitude. The Los Angeles Community College was sued for failure to provide accessible library collections. Here you see the question about accessibility and library collections has been continually deferred, I think up until th this case, where the, the LACC was found to be responsible and negligent to provide accommodations for students with disabilities. This introduced urgency but also uncertainty into the conversation about accessibility, um, our vast, vast technical debt with our legacy collections and how to address that. We started late last year to connect with these problems, uh, connecting with the, this accessibility network, and we realized the extent of the accessibility work burden. Uh, 
quickly came to understand that it would probably at least double the cost of our digitization efforts, if not increase the cost even more. Um, and we also found it very, very difficult to find resources regarding accessibility for digitization. Most of the materials out there are about making accessible PDFs if you're starting with Word or if you're designing a syllabus for your students or if you're creating cultural heritage websites. But there wasn't really much about PDFs. Then I found this article provocatively titled PDFA Considered Harmful for Digital Preservation. I, this, the article explains that this format of title is, I think, a tradition, I think, in computer science to, to talk about problems. And it highlighted the problem that PDFA has, is a de facto standard for digital preservation in the cultural heritage community. But Although it does a really good job of addressing file format portability, it does not really do any work in terms of addressing the accessibility and the transferability of the content. It was at this point that we realized that solving our accessibility problems was something that also fell under our digital preservation mandate. And if we're, what we're really trying to do is make the information in our documents portable, to really expose it as part of our archival information package, then it dovetailed nicely with our goals uh, to provide accessibility. So there's this standard called PDF UA. The UA stands for Universal Accessibility. It's generally considered equivalent to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, that many of you may be familiar with for websites, but it applies instead to document formats. It requires that content is categorized as either meaningful content or artifacts or background images. It requires meaningful content is tagged with appropriate semantic tags and that tag structure should be, should indicate a logical reading order of the text. And it requires among many, many other things that pictures must have alternative text. And so we're working now to advocate simultaneously for accessibility, um, remediation for legacy content, establishing workflows to do it on demand, and also building it into our core digitization workflow as part of doing the right thing to provide accessibility, but also providing digital preservation for our contents by making sure the intellectual contents of the stuff that we're digitizing is as accessible as it can be. Mm -hmm. I it's, always like Oh, oh, yeah, one more point, real quick. Uh, it was, so, as I mentioned, the digital content team is focused on digitized documents where we have essentially complete workflow control. And we do acknowledge that this approach does not really accommodate born digital records. And we think that the future for addressing that problem is with increasing compliance with the dollar DCPMM model that emphasizes that relationships with providers are a good place to start in terms of dealing with file formats and making sure you get preservable file formats. And I think this probably also extends to accessibility and our broader campus culture around accessibility probably also has a role in improving this. The highest level takeaway I think from this is that if you preserve your files and have the greatest digital preservation policies ever and in 50 years someone goes to use these wonderfully preserved files but they're not accessible and they can't use them anyway, what was the point of preserving them? And so we really like to build this accessibility um, workflow into digital preservation because those, these two are really interconnected and that's that's a very important topic for us yeah. here. And it makes the cost of digitization something that's very real and very present instead mm -hmm. of pretending that it's something that we could or should defer uh, yeah. and turn into technical debt. So um, our unique challenge at the University of Akron is fighting the right digital asset management system or DAM, which is the abbreviation. When searching for the right digital asset management system, two things that we have to keep in mind are any budgeting obstacles we might come across and if the upper administration will go along with it. These two bullet points are related to each other since the administration approves the budget. Before the pandemic hit the US, our goal was to make a pitch about having a digital preservation program to our current supervisors, then getting their support to pitch it to the upper administration of the university. 
Unfortunately, due to revenue shortfalls and the budget cuts that are a result of that, we have to shift our focus to policies we can institute at low or no cost and prepare our plans for when the financial situation at the university improves. If when the financial situation improves, the hope is we will be able to get approval for our plan and also better equipment and additional positions if we prepare the groundwork for it now. So we'll also kind of discuss um, the digital asset management systems that we currently have. And for Content DM, this is our digital collections website. Um, uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with it. Um, we have been using it uh, for a really long time. I actually don't know how long, um, longer than I've been there. Um, and uh, while it, it does serve its purpose and uh, it works for us, um, it's not perfect and we do have some items on our wish list um, you know for that sort of thing but uh, we are very um, thankful and grateful for the remote accessibility of some of our digital collections especially during this pandemic um, patrons can and users can access content without physically coming into the facility which is very helpful for us right now because we are closed um, uh, there are a lot of people that come in and like to look at the physical collections and if we do have access to them online, we can point them to there um, instead of, of uh, you know, just telling them they, they can't access anything. Um, and we have seen an increase in usage of Content DM um, with coronavirus um, and we're also working to put more stuff on there um, because of that. Uh, what we've also found is that digital preservation is becoming more relevant for us in the, in the light of this current pandemic. Um, and we're starting to see uh, more clearly why um, it will become so important to our institution in the near future. And then um, this is just a screen grab of Content DM, just in case um, there's anybody out there who's never seen it or isn't familiar with it. Um, this is what it looks like for us um, currently. Now we are going to discuss SharePoint, which we also use, and some of you might be wondering what it is. SharePoint is a Microsoft product that is a web-based collaborative platform that offers document management and storage space. Electronic Services, which is another library department and also one that I work in, uses SharePoint frequently to store loading guides, tracking sheets, and documentation. Archival services began transitioning from institutional servers to SharePoint in 2019, and the process is still ongoing. In the near future, all campus servers will be uploaded onto SharePoint. Um, as far as its usability, um, there are definitely some advantages and some challenges that come with it. Again, I will reiterate our absolute gratitude um, for remote access access during this time. Um, we're very grateful that we don't have to go through VPNs to access a lot of our digital content. Um, uh, we are able to just access it from any internet browser, which is very helpful. Um, another thing that's helpful about it is that it complies with um, the NDSA and dollar model with the use of cloud storage. Um, so, you know, that's a big plus for us in the area of digital preservation. Um, access can also be deter determined per member guest. Um, this has also been helpful for us because we do have student workers who are currently working uh, remotely as well. Um, and so it's very nice uh, to be able to allow them access to that. And we can also, um, you know, change it so that they can't, um, you know, edit or delete files. Um, they, can, they can view the files, but they can't necessarily change them. Um, also, it notifies administrators when files are changed, edited, or deleted, which is helpful. And it actually, with the deleting feature, um, files aren't actually fully deleted. Um, they go into a recycle bin when they're deleted, and then they're like permanently deleted after two months. So if you accidentally have a mishap where you accidentally move a file or delete a file, um, it's easy to change it. And you can see who viewed or edited it. Um, uh, at any time, um, which is, is nice, you know, if you have something, a, a mix up or something, you can kind of track to see where that, where that was, um, or who, who accidentally uh, changed something. Um, another thing, sorry, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so for challenges, um, 
one of the things uh, that we have found difficult about SharePoint is that it does not accept all file formats, um, including MOV. We do have a lot of digitized film um, and VHS tapes that we do um, share, uh, store there. And so it's kind of difficult for it to not accept MOV. Um, we do have issues with uploading and long loading times. Um, you know, we've had issues with um, maybe we thought we uploaded a file and it wasn't appearing. So there are some issues with that. And then with viewing um, large files, uh, a lot of times it doesn't open the folder if the file is too big or you have to download it to view it, which can be um, challenging. Um, also, there's other complications with naming conventions um, and then metadata and checksums uh, are also difficult and we're still trying to iron out all of those details and figure out how to do those. Um, but yeah. So in the end, uh, SharePoint is not recommended as a long term file storage for digital collections. It is better as a collaborative platform for short term file storage and documentation. And here's a screenshot of SharePoint for those that are unfamiliar with it. In the far right hand side is the ID column. That is generated by SharePoint and not us. So just really quick, we wanna save room for questions and we're running a little bit short on time, but where we are now is that UC Libraries has um, drafted really great digital preservation guidelines and we're now working to address our legacy content but because we have full control over our digitization workflows for new incoming digital collections we've got a good grasp on you know what we need to do to preserve our files moving forward and setting up for remediation workflows for that legacy content And then for archival services, um, one of the three things, or I guess three things that we want to focus on in, in the near future um, is number one, finishing up the assessment. Um, and I know Sydney was talking about, you know, all of the work being, uh, most of um, digital preservation work being front loaded. And we're really kind of in the thick of that right now, uh, finishing or at least starting some of that front loading work. So we're hoping to Number one, finish, finish up some of that. Number two, um, start drafting our policy. Um, we want to eventually write a policy, but we, um, you know, we feel that we're um, unable to right now at the moment. We need to do more research. We need to do more assessment and um, you know, write a policy that works for us. Um, and then number three, we do want to write a white paper for our institution. Um, possibly uh, pitching a digital preservation position or, you know, um, kind of outlining some of the guidelines that we want uh, for the policy and stuff like that. So um, that's where we are right now. Um, lastly, we just want to say that knowing your own content and your own challenges um, allows you to tailor your policy to your institution. And it's just to say that please customize as much as possible. And there's no one size fits all for policies and getting to know what you need is the best way to create your digital preservation policy. Um, and here in our slide deck, we've linked all the resources we talked about. And in case you're interested in any of them, feel free to go back and review them and read them. Um, they're really interesting and we found them all super helpful. Um, and so thank you guys all for listening to our presentation. Um, we have a short link to our presentation for resources if you want to come back to it. And um, we're available for any questions now. Thank you guys. Um, I'm, so a reminder, you can enter questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom screen. Um, and I will go ahead and read any questions that come in um, to the presenters and then they can respond. We had one question about resources that you found useful, but I think that the, your last slide actually answered that question already. So that's the only one we have so far. I would like to say that going through the work of doing the assessments, especially for the dollar model, um, helped us understand our ignorance, uh, defined what we didn't, didn't know. And then working, doing the work to understand that. And then also, I don't know if this is surprising or not, reading through the OAIS model is very, very helpful too 
because it's really good. And we learned a lot about our own shortcomings as our digital objects are modeled by understanding how it relates to our content and workflows. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say if you only have time to do one assessment, um, I wouldn't do the dollar assessment just because, you know, it hits all the points and it doesn't focus on one leg of the digital yeah. preservation stool. We have another question from the chat. It says, can you talk a little bit more about if and how you're using metadata in SharePoint? So, um, yeah, that's a really good question. We are still trying to iron out all the details. Currently, we have students um, who are completing metadata for like, I don't know, right now we have a, um, like a photograph collection that we're doing metadata for. And right now we're just having them um, deposit that information into a spreadsheet. Um, we haven't really figured out if you can like edit embedded metadata like in SharePoint. Um, I think to do that we would have to like download the files and then edit it. Um, but if that answers your question or if I can expand upon anything else. Um, yeah, so we just as I said, we just um, usually put that in a separate, we use Excel spreadsheets and that's how we do uploads to content DM or how we, um, you know, get that material online as we use, we uh, use the spreadsheets for that. Which can also be stored on SharePoint. Um, SharePoint can store any, I mean, it's kind of like the same sort of thing with like servers. It's like any type of file, except as I had said, MOVs. And I would like to add, um, since SharePoint is a Microsoft product, it does not take any Apple products, which QuickTime is. Mm. We have time for a few more questions, if there are any. Oh, there's my cat. <gasps> <laughs> well, if there aren't any more questions, we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you to our presenters for your presentation today. And a reminder that this uh, presentation is being recorded and you should receive um, a link with uh, or a link to the recording after this session in your email. Um, and yes, you will get an evaluation for this session. It should pop up in your browser if you can take a couple minutes and just fill that out for us as well. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you guys.